Hey, welcome back to Liam Locke Gaming. I am Liam Locke, and we are back in the uh, Flight Simulator X Steam Edition Flight Simulator. And today we are flying in a different plane. Uh, I've been learning how to fly in the Airbus A320 and A321, and today we're in the Boeing 777. Uh, this is a new aircraft for me. I've been working through the startup procedures, and honestly, I thought that it would be a relatively easy transition from the Airbus to the Boeing. Yeah, not so much. Uh, that wasn't my experience. Uh, there's quite a bit to learn about those systems, some different acronyms, even though they're for similar type systems. Controls are in different places. They have uh, different indicators on them, and uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's been a little bit of a uh, a little bit of work uh, learning how to fly this particular plane. But I think I'm at a point now where I've customized my checklist based off what's in the documentation for this plane, and we're going to work through it now. This is not perfect. This is not really intended to be a tutorial. If I teach you something, I think that's great. I appreciate you watching this video, but I'm going to kind of go through what I have learned so far. And we are sitting on the tarmac here in uh, Dulles International Airport in Virginia. So we're going to get this plane started up from the cold and dark state, and we're going to be flying to Orlando International Airport today in uh, Florida. So let's go ahead and get things started. Uh, we'll jump back in the cockpit. I've already put the plane in the uh, cold and dark state, and we want to walk through the uh, startup process. Uh, I do have my custom checklist over here off to the left, and I'm basically going to start working through it. One of the things that I've learned that's uh, a little bit different uh, in this particular plane is when we go over here and we turn on the battery, uh, the plane doesn't initially fully initialize at all. I mean, I don't have access to the CDU. A lot of systems don't immediately come on. Uh, unlike in the Airbus. Uh, so it changes the startup procedures just a little bit because I would typically go to ground power immediately, but I don't have the option to do that without that CDU being turned on. So we're going to go to APU pretty much out of the gate. Uh, a couple other things we're going to check. So the, the way they have this checklist work, uh, which also is a little bit different than from the Airbus, is we're going to work the overhead panel basically down each section and make sure that the uh, the controls and the push buttons are in the positions that we expect them to be in. So we've got the battery on. Uh, the thrust uh, as asymmetry uh, comp switch is in the uh, on, or I should say in the auto position. Uh, our electrical systems for the IFU passenger should be in the on position. Cabin, ca cabin utility power switch should be on. Uh, we want to go to the APU generator switch and make sure that it's on. Our bus tie switches are in the auto position. Our generator control buttons down here are in the uh, on position, as well as our backup generator switches are set to on. And with all of those being in their proper positions, we can go up here and turn the APU to the on position. And then we're going to click it one more time and hold it on the start. It's going to bounce back on its own, and that's going to start the initialization of the uh, APU. If we look outside, you'll notice here in the uh, tail of the aircraft, there's this little vent that pops open automatically. Uh, that's our air inlet, and the APU is going to start its uh, initialization process. takes a little bit for that to come online, so we're going to go right back in and continue with our checklist. Uh, continuing down uh, this left side, so the left wiper is in the off position. We confirm that. Uh, we want to make sure that our ground proximity runway override switch is closed and off. We'll go ahead and close the guard here on our emergency lights. That will automatically put this switch into the armed position, so that's all we have to do there. Uh, we don't want the pass oxygen button to be pressed or to be open. Uh, that drops the oxygen masks. We do want all the window heat switches to be in the on position. The ram air turbine uh, should be not lit up right now, and it's not. And the hydraulics we're going to come back to here in a little bit. We don't really need to change anything with the hydraulic systems. Uh, until we're getting ready to start the engines, so we can s skip those for the moment. Now they're all in the correct position, uh, as they are right now. Looking at our passenger no smoking and seatbelt signs, we want to make sure that no smoking is on, good to go. We're going to put our seatbelts in the uh, on position. And we can control the overhead brightness uh, if it was dark out and we wanted these uh, labels to be backlit. We can control that here with these adjustment dials. But you really don't even have to mess with these. 
Um, it recommends that you bring them to the 12 o'clock position, but you've got this master bright switch over here, which is kind of setting them all to a default brightness. And as long as the center button is pushed in, uh, that's enabled, and you really don't have to mess with these. Um, just out of habit on my checklist, uh, I am putting them up to the uh, 12 o'clock position. Easier to probably show these uh, in a night flight, which I'll do uh, another time. While we're down here in the lights, uh, we don't need our landing lights on yet, but we do want to jump over here to the right just briefly and turn on our navigation lights since we are in a cockpit and starting to get things turned on. Um, apparently that is general practice, just to let the ground screw know that there is someone on board the plane starting to do work. So we'll take care of that. Uh, we want to go up to the next column here on our overhead console. We've got our APU fire indication and our cargo uh, fire indication and arm lights. We can test these real quick, but this test switch not only tests the APU fire notification system, it also tests the left and right engine notifications down on the pedestal. If you jump down to the pedestal, these here are our left and right engine fire notifications. And likewise, our fuel pumps, fuel pumps are these switches here, these the black tops are actually warning indicators themselves. So if you wanted to see all these things test by pressing that button, what you can do is just go up here and bring open a new view, the cockpit, and bring up the pedestal. So now we have a quick view of the pedestal. And we get our ears buzzed off by the initialization of the cockpit, uh, audible uh, alert systems. Uh, that's what that feedback buzz was. But now on the overhead console, if we click the test button, you'll notice that all of these systems light up. So we've got the APU, cargo fire, and then if you look over here, let me just zoom in a little bit to make this easier to see. Now let's try this again. If you click on that fire warning, you'll see everything lights up left and right engine fire warning as well as the APU and notice the lights in the fuel control switches as well. All right. And we'll go ahead and close this window. So that's one of the items on our checklist. Uh, we don't need to arm the cargo fire switches. We want to make sure that our engine control is set to normal, our EEC mode is normal, our start is set to normal as well, and that our auto start is turned on. Uh, the fuel jettison switches in their default positions, uh, they should not be initialized. This button should be pushed in, and we don't need to arm that system right now. Looking at the crossfeed and the fuel pump switches, they're all currently off. We don't need those turned on yet because we're not ready to start the engines. So we can leave those uh, as they are. Uh, not cold outside today, so we don't need any wing or engine anti-ice. We're good to go there. Uh, we've already got our navigation light turned on. We don't need any of the other lights turned on right now because it is early in the morning daylight time. Looking in the next, the last column, our engine air conditioning, so our equipment cooling should be set to auto, our uh, gasper turned on, our recirculating fan set to on, and then we have our flight deck and our cabin temperatures. Uh, we can adjust those a little bit. Uh, they recommend keeping them straight up 12 o'clock. I usually back them off just a little bit. Uh, it just seems like a more realistic temperature uh, in the plane for passengers doesn't really matter I'm sure but you know for my my uh, my realism that's what I go for uh, we also since we have the APU running uh, we want to turn on our left and right packs and get the cockpit in the cabin cooling from our APU bleed Lead air should be set to auto over here, and our uh, APU is set to auto as well. 
the left and right engines bleed air should be set on automatically even though the engines are off so the indicators for off will be currently illuminated pressurization in the cabin uh, don't really mess with this too much uh, both these switches need to be in auto everything else stays as is and then we just verify that the right wiper is off now this particular checklist that I'm working through is actually the first officer's checklist who would perform all of these checks and if he's continuing uh, through his areas of the aircraft, his or her area of the aircraft, uh, we're going to drop down to the first officer's side of the flight deck and continue with our checks from down there. And again, it's kind of a systematic scroll uh, through the various controls that the first officer typically works with. So our flight director, first officer's side, we're going to go ahead and get that turned on. Our lower center display here is already active. In our EFIS panel, uh, really nothing to change here right now. Uh, all of these things, I am going to be working with uh, minimums, uh, a minimum barrow uh, when we come in for a landing. Uh, I'm not working with uh, hectopascal, so I'll be doing inches of mercury for our barometer setting. I've already set the map with the 20 mile radius it looks like. I don't need to make any changes to the VOR ADF switches. I'll leave those systems off currently. Uh, and don't need to make any changes to what's being displayed on my navigation display at this point. Well, we'll go ahead and just acknowledge this caution to clear it off the screen. The checklist that uh, comes with the 777, uh, if you're going to play for full realistic value, uh, you can take a look over here at your oxygen mask and do a quick test on it. Make sure that we've got air flowing to our oxygen mask. And then we're going to work backwards here to our side displays. We do have more lighting controls, but you really don't need to adjust these. Uh, the backlit controls are being controlled by the master. However, this floodlight is not controlled by the master, so if you want a little, uh, the overhead lights to illuminate your particular instrumentation, you can go ahead and turn this up to the 12 o'clock as well, and you'll notice that it starts to brighten up a little bit inside the cockpit on your side of the aircraft. Uh, I don't really mess with any of the other settings. Everything looks fine there right now. Uh, we don't have a need to turn on any of these switches, uh, nav, display control, or the air data attitude. Uh, they remain in the off position. Take a look at the clock, make sure the time is what we expect. Currently Zulu time 1227, and that's, that's uh, about 827 in the morning in Virginia. So that is correct. Our inboard display is set to the MFD, multifunction display, so that's correct, and our FMC is set for auto, verify that. Continuing down the list at this point, what I have noted in my checklist since I'm working with GSX Ground Services, is this is a perfect time to call for service uh, at this stage of the checklist. So I want to bring up the GSX Ground Services control, and I'm gonna go ahead and request catering service. And we're gonna use whoever they're bringing to us, that's fine. And while they're on the way, I'm also going to call for refueling just to kind of get that queued up as well. Uh, what will happen is GSX is going to bring us... I, I, I've covered If you watch any of my videos, I've kind of covered this before, so I don't want to feel like I'm repeating stuff constantly. But basically, we got catering and fuel service on the way. At this point, also... Um, the checklist that comes with the aircraft says that before I check the rest of the instrumentation for the first officer's side, I really need to go through my pre-flight procedures um, for setting up the CDU. I'm not ready to do that yet, so I'm going to jump over real quick and do the uh, captain's uh, checklist. So we're going to look at his side of the aircraft and go through his uh, systems as well. So the first thing we're going to look at is the uh, EFIS panel. Again, no changes to be made here. We are using inches of mercury. Uh, none of these other settings need to change, similar to what we had on the other side, uh, the first officer's side. We do want to turn on the captain's flight director. We want both, both of those systems to be enabled on both sides. 
take a look at our auto throttle arm switches. Those are typically on and always left on, and they are currently in the on position, so we don't have anything to change there. Uh, heading should be set to heading. So heading track is set to heading, which is fine. Uh, we're set for IAS. We don't have any need to modify the uh, bank limit switch. No need to change vertical speed or our alt altitude increment selector. Uh, actually, what we do, what I do like to do is the altitude selector is set for auto right now. Uh, we're going to go over here. And we're just going to put that to thousands because we're going to be likely going to an even thousand level of altitude. That's what we've cleared for when we go for takeoff. And now GSX is alerting us that the catering vehicles are in position, so we want to go ahead and get the doors open. Now that we've got the CDU turned on, we can go down here to FS Actions. Let's go out here and grab our doors. And they're asking for the right entry 2 and right entry door 4. So we need to disarm door 2, open up door 2, and the same thing with door 4. Jump outside, take a quick look at them. So they are in position and starting to load the aircraft. There's really nothing more we need to do at this point, but continue on with our checklist, and that's what we're going to do. So back to the captain side of the plane. Likewise, uh, captain's got his oxygen mask. Just jump over here to the left. Do a quick little test on that. Looks good to go. Side controls, same thing with the uh, floodlights, so those aren't controlled by the master dimmer switch. Go ahead and get those up to the 12 o'clock position. Looks good. Clock verified is good. Nav, display control, air data, attitude uh, switches are in the off position here, so off is good. Our Inboard display is also set for MFD, and the one setting we have over here on the captain's side is our heading references set to normal. And now we are ready to move on to doing our CDU pre-flight procedure. But before we can do that, uh, one thing we waited on starting up that's actually back on the overhead console is our ADIRU, our air data, yeah, <laughs> air data, our air data inertial reference unit. We want to go ahead and get that in the on position. That takes a little while to initialize. Uh, I believe that the particular setting I have on this aircraft defaults to the 30 second initialization as opposed to the six minute initialization. Uh, I'm okay with that for the sake of this, but uh, you can customize that to your liking. With that initialized, we're gonna go back down here to the uh, captain side of the aircraft. And it actually says over here, time to align on your navigation display and it's counting down. Well, that's counting down. We are being alerted. It looks like GSX uh, is done with the catering service. So we want to go ahead and close those doors. We're pretty much back to where we were. We're going to get those closed up. And they'll be on their way here momentarily. So we'll go out and take a look. And that's pretty exciting. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I don't want to kill a lot of time looking at GSX ground services. I love to watch it myself. You've probably seen it many times, so we're going to go back to our checklist. All right. Back to our captain seat. We're going to do a quick uh, status check here. Now, one thing that I like to do is... The display controls here for the EICAS ECAS system are over here on the first officer side. Yeah. Working from the captain seat, a little difficult to work with those, so I can enable those controls right on my CDU. If I go back here to display control and just turn this on, uh, now I can control what I actually see on the ECAS system from my CDU. And I want to go to status. Take a look at our oxygen pressure, and 1850 looks good, so we don't have any issues there to worry about. 
Uh, the checklist that comes with the aircraft has a bunch of other things that you can actually check depending on uh, what plane you're flying since we're flying the passenger version today and not a freight. Uh, some of these checklist items we can kind of skip over. Uh, one thing I do want to do is at this point is put the parking brake on the plane. Uh, we do have wheel chocks out there under the wheels, but we'll need this to be enabled later in the flight uh, when we remove those wheel chocks. So that's set. And one thing I would point out is uh, realize that there's no electric or engine-based hydraulic pressure being created right now in the hydraulic system. And you can see that the pressure is actually 50 PSI, which is very low across the three hydraulic systems. And the our brake accumulator pressure indicated over here is actually following as we manipulate the brakes. So whether I squeeze the brakes uh, with my joystick controller or with the button on the keyboard, or if I manipulate the parking brake, that pressure will drop off because there's not sufficient pressure in the system to sustain it. So I just took the parking brake off, and you'll see if I apply it again, that pressure indication drops down even more. So just be conscious of that. So with the parking brake set, I'm waiting on fueling, and that should be here momentarily. In fact, let's just take a look outside. Uh, the status of the fuel truck, we can bring up GSX services, and we see that the uh, fuel truck is actually on its way to us. So we are just waiting for it to arrive, and then we can go in and indicate how much fuel we're gonna be taking on this flight uh, from Virginia to Florida today. It's pretty different working with the uh, 777 compared to the Airbus. Honestly, I didn't realize in real life how big a size difference there is between the 777 and the Airbus. I always considered them both to be fairly large aircraft, but good lord, the uh, the 777 is a big box, I mean, like just over 200 feet by 200 feet wide. Uh, and it's kind of funny seeing the uh, fuel truck uh, ground services animate to actually lift up the platform so that the uh, worker can get the uh, the fuel hose connected to the under part of the wing. Uh, similar to working with the Airbus, uh, ground services is going to hook up and then they're going to wait for us to take some action on our CDU to actually put fuel into the plane. So it's going to start chirping at us here in a moment once he finishes up that connection. Uh, we'll go ahead and jump back in to the uh, captain side of the cockpit. And there he is saying go ahead and refuel our aircraft. So today's fuel uh, for flying from Virginia to Florida, uh, we're going to we're gonna load on 25.8 tons of fuel. Uh, I am working with the kilograms unit on this particular flight as opposed to uh, our gallons and uh, our weight, our typical weight. So we need to go to, uh, back to our menu, back to our FS actions, go to fuel. And the other thing about this is it, it's got a, it's actually fully loaded with fuel and not very realistic. So I'm going to have to drop it down and then add a little bit of fuel into it. So we'll just put it down to a minimum, 2.4 tons. Puts it down to none. That's not going to be enough to kind of cue him to do his job. So now I want to put a positive amount of fuel up to 25.8 to see it's still chirping at me to put fuel in the plane. So now I put a positive number in there above what I already had, 25.8 load. And that is going to trigger GSX to actually put fuel on the aircraft. And you'll see the fuel truck now ticks up. Wow, it went really fast. Fuel is fully loaded, so he's already finished his work. <laughs> okay. back inside while he finishes up. Uh, at this point, <clears throat> looks like we have our uh, IRU has aligned. We're complete with the alignment. We're getting ready to go into the CDU, but before I start that, uh, something that also takes a little bit of time is the GSX boarding. And we're gonna get that started right now. So we're going to request boarding for 
and I have mine configured to ask me approximately how many passengers and what I have annotated today is 279 however goodness gracious it takes a long time to load all these passengers so you know for the sake of simulation I'm just going to drop in a number like 125 uh, we'll just let it continue to load as we start to program the CDU right now the next piece of information we need to get before we pop onto the CDU real quick is the ATIS information for the airport. So we'll go ahead and tune in ATIS, which of course is not going to work here initially until I go down to my radio, which is in fact already on. What I don't have turned on, my control, so light on. Now I can hear the actual radio, and I can tune in ATIS again. Alright, so we have our runway information as being one left and one right actively in use. Um, I'm pretty confident they're going to give me one right, so we need that for the CDU. I also have my uh, altimeter setting of 299 or 2. Uh, that is good as well. Uh, the GSX is chirping at me because when you start the boarding process, I need to open up the cargo bay doors. Jump back up here to the CDU to our FS controls. We're going to go to doors again. We need to go to next page here in order to see the cargo doors. So we're going to open our forward and our aft cargo doors so they can do what they need to do. And the passengers are going to be boarding through the jetway, which I'm pretty sure that I am already connected up. But I guess I should just go ahead and double check that real quick. And I am. So the jetway is already connected. We're good to go on that front. You can see the cargo bay doors opening on the uh, right side of the aircraft. So we'll go back in now. First order of business is to access our FMC and enter our inertial position. Take a look at your uh, IDENT information. So we are flying the 777-200 plane today with the GE-90 engines with 110,000 pounds of thrust. Our nav data ARAC is current and up to date, so that is good. We're going to go to position init here. And we want to grab, we want to verify the time first. So it is 12.43 Zelo. We, were, we already looked at the time. We want to click on this GPS position here to load it down here into the scratch pad. And then we're going to set our inertial position with that information. Uh, with that set, we also want to put in our reference airport. And we are at uh, Dulles International. So we'll drop and everything is pretty lined up right here, so this looks good to go. Now we want to select the route select button. And once again, we're going to put in our origin airport. We're going to put in our destination airport. And our flight number today is going to be 7258. We're not loading any company route. We're going to manually program our route into the CDU, into the flight management computer. So now we want to go to our departure arrivals hey, button. How are you? I'm doing good. And for departure today, we're going to pick runway or one right. And if we look at our flight plan, which I did file through SimBrief, uh, it actually indicates what my SID is going to be.
and it happens to be Jacoby 3 and we do have that so we'll go back over here we're going to indicate Jacoby 3 and the first waypoint on our our flight plan is Colin. Now, I'm not sure about this, quite honestly. It seems to make sense that my transition from Jacoby 3 would actually be my first waypoint. If this is wrong for some reason, uh, by all means, tell me so. But I'm going to go ahead and select Colin, select Colin as my transition. Now, that's all we have to do there on our departure sheet. From here, we want to go to the next page button. Uh, scratch that. Go back to route. From there, click next page. And now we can start to put in the remaining uh, legs of our flight plan. So we already have two Colin from our transition out of the SID. And the next airway is going to be J61. Two hubs. And then direct to the Kemper waypoint. So I have a DCT on my flight plan. So I don't have a route per se that I'm going to enter. I'm going to go over here to my two waypoint and just put in Kemper. Click there and direct automatically appears over here for my uh, my route. Next, I have another direct to a VOR waypoint of ILM. So same scenario, ILM direct. Now there's a bunch of ILMs. Uh, nine times out of ten, it seems to always be the first one, uh, but you want to verify that. And I think I already have that verified as being. 117, yes, 117. There we go. And then from ILM, we do have another route, AR-15. To HIBAC, or H-I-B-A-C. And that is the last waypoint before we enter our star. Now we want to go back to our departure arrival button. And we want to click our arrival into Orlando. Arriving. And according to my Simbri flight plan, they've got me going into runway 35 right. So we'll go ahead and go with that. Uh, but ATC may direct us to another runway which won't be a problem at all so next page we'll go ahead and pick what Simbrief has given us as ILS 35 right uh, Simbrief has also given us what our star should be uh, C, C World 4 C World 4 and our last waypoint on our flight plan was HIBAC so again I'm going with that seems like a likely transition into the uh, star that's what we're going to select. Right, with that selected, we're going to go to our legs. And now we can kind of scroll through here and see if we have any flight plan discontinuities. So here is our SID. Pardon me. Sorry about that. And from into Colin, which was our first waypoint, through the rest of the waypoints on our flight plan until we get to uh, Highback. And Highback starts our transition into our star and the remaining waypoints for our star and our arrival into the airport. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, minimums here above 3,000 feet speed changes so this appears to be good to go I don't see any flight plan discontinuity so we're, we're done with that particular part 
now we can go back to from the legs view we want to activate this flight plan so we click on activate our exec button here is going to light up we're going to go ahead and click exec and now the flight plan has been activated now we've got a couple more things we need to do so now we need to go to our init reference first order of business is our zero fuel weight right now we need to put in either gross weight or zero fuel weight zero fuel weight is the easiest one to work with so according to my sim brief flight plan uh, based off of the number of passengers and cargo that I kind of indicated uh, during the filing of my flight plan sim brief has calculated that my estimated zero fuel weight is going to be 191.8 I don't have any, I don't believe I have anybody on this plane right now, so one thing I need to do before I actually click on this button to retrieve the zero fuel weight is I need to go back to my payload because I didn't set that up to begin with. So I'm going to jump back to payload and the aircraft already has kind of a default number of first class, business class, economy class passengers as well as some cargo and some bark, bulk cargo already loaded onto the plane. And it indicates here that based off of this load, right, that I have a zero fuel weight of 185.1 metric tons. Well, my zero fuel weight, according to my flight plan, is what I need to have here in the system. So I can automatically redistribute redist redist uh, passenger count, cargo, by simply modifying this zero fuel weight to match what I have on my my flight plan. And that number, I said uh, 191.8, so we're just gonna enter that right now. 191.8 metric tons, change our zero fuel weight, and our passenger count and cargo is all gonna update to reflect this zero fuel weight. Now that I've got that straightened out, I can go back to my flight plan my init reference data. Now, I need to put that same number in a zero fuel weight, and I don't. I could manually type it in if I wanted to, or I could just click zero fuel weight, and it's going to retrieve what we just entered into the other payload screen. So now this is in a scratch pad. I just click zero fuel weight again, and now I have my gross weight and my zero fuel weight programmed in. It's perfect. Just taking a quick look here at my takeoff weight as calculated again by Simbri. Estimated takeoff weight is going to be 217.1. I am not burning through a lot of fuel yet. I am using some fuel for the APU, and I'm at 217.6. So hopefully we'll be relatively close to that uh, when it comes time for takeoff. Uh, my reserve fuel today, jump back up here and look. It's going to believe it's going to be 10 10.6 it looks like so we're going to drop in 10.6 metric tons of fuel for reserve it seems like a lot of fuel uh, that's what's on my flight plan cruising altitude today is going to be flight level 380 and then the cost index uh, as i put it into sim brief i believe it was 42 Yep, there it is, 42. Dulles, clearance delivery, orbit 6155, right now. I'm gonna go one, back to, with those settings one, one, one. in place, six, one, five, look at reset, thrust reset, limit, ground, on one. and now I got GSX chirping at me. Basically, they're saying they're finished with boarding, so let me just stop that chirp here real quick and I'll come back to this thought. Uh, otherwise, they'll continue to annoy us. So, back to this actions. Get our door shut here. We're gonna close our jetway door. Go ahead and get these doors armed up. Cargo should be done as well. So we'll get the cargo bay doors closed up. We'll go back to our knit reference uh, with regard to what we were talking about with the thrust limit. So, 
my takeoff weight 217.1 which is really low um, you look at the chart just bring it up here for the sake of reference I'm just going back up in the list so we got dry runway conditions and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this um, so runway length 3500 meters uh, we'll take off with flaps 15 on a dry runway uh, at that length we'll say 3400 at 14 degrees Celsius outside you know my takeoff weight limit was is up around 358.2 metric tons which I'm not even close to uh, even at a 50 degree outside a 50 degree Celsius outside temperature my maximum takeoff weights 311 so I've got lots of room there uh, that I can bump up that uh, uh, assumed temperature outside and still have plenty of runway to get the plane off the ground even if I evaluate my my climb limit weight at 14 degrees 350.9 metric tons according to the sheet and just so you can see what I'm looking at I think I can bring this over here oh don't do that that's not what I wanted to do so dry runway flap 15 uh, 3400 uh, meters on the runway 14 degrees Celsius outside so I said 358.2 even at 50 degrees Celsius uh, takeoff weight can be 311.6 uh, my climb limit at sea level pressure 350.9 in the 14 degrees Celsius column uh, 290.6 in the 50 degrees so I can go further out so today is a little bit of an experiment because I kind of did this calculation in advance uh, rather than just dropping at 50 which is kind of what I've been doing just taking the maximum base here on this particular spreadsheet uh, I came up with a number uh, if I, I did, did some uh, quick interoperation and some uh, cross multiplication and basically came up with the dry runway takeoff weight of 159 degrees Celsius or my max climb was 130 degrees Celsius so I need to take the lower of those two uh, and I'm not going to show the math right here if you want to know there's a I found a couple of videos out there on YouTube that kind of explain it, but feel free to ask a question if you want me to kind of go through how I worked it up. So for all I know, my math is wrong, so definitely don't uh, trust me, but I'm going to drop in 130 degrees and see if we can get the plane off the ground. Um, so that's, that's what we're going to try. <laughs> Alright, so that's kind of a long-winded way of saying uh, it seems to be awfully high, but that's what we're going to do. So back out here, and let's see what happens. 130 degrees assumes temperature. Ah, too high. Invalid entry. So I think I can go higher. I know I can go higher than 50 because in the uh, introduction they talk about setting it to 58. So I need to figure out what is too high for this. Uh, let's go with, let's just see if it takes 75 out of curiosity. Clear this. Will it take 75? Hello. It will take 75. 83%. So the math seems to be a little bit off. Um, I know I've gotten off the ground with 50. Um, I'm, at, I'm pretty sure I can get off of 58. Let's just go ahead and give this a try. Let's see what this uh, let's see what this does. Let's see if we can take off with uh, 75 degrees Celsius as our assumed temperature and a, a D-rated takeoff using 83.8% uh, of the engines. Seems pretty low, but uh, I'm gonna give it a shot. What do you think? So back to our checklist. Calculated assumed temperature, yes. We've entered the assumed temperature. Take off. We've got our climb two is armed. We want to do our 
can go to takeoff now. We're going to do a flaps 15 takeoff. Those are the numbers that we were looking at. We can recall our center of gravity from our payload sheet. So we'll, all we need to do is just click this line select, 29.7, drop it back in as our center of gravity. That's going to give us our VREF speeds. And we want to enable those so they appear on the speed tape. 137, 137, 143 is what it's giving us. Yep. Go back to our legs button here. And now we can go back and continue with our uh, pre-flight procedure checks for the first officer. So back over to his side of the cockpit. We want to make sure that uh, looking at our FMA, our auto throttle is blank. We have toga in both uh, the roll and pitch mode columns. Our AFDS is set for flight director, and it is. We do have uh, the expected display on our multifunction display, our navigation display. Uh, the various lights over here for ground proximity, uh, all of these systems are turned off, not currently enabled. We want to set our auto brake for RTO. Go back here and put our engine displays back on. Now, remember I had activated the display over here on the left CDU. Well, that's the only place I can control it right now until I turn that off. So we can go back to menu and turn our display control off. Now I can take control of it elsewhere or I can just use uh, the controls up here on the first officer side. So here's our engine display. Uh, the first officer apparently looks at the uh, radio settings as well, so uh, radio is set for the captain. Uh, our secondary radio is turned on. You can go ahead and turn on these controls as well if you wanted to. Uh, our weather radar, we want to go ahead and set those switches as well. So all I'm doing, if you can see this, is putting uh, weather plus T. We're not going to have any weather really to see on this flight because we're flying in fair weather again. And this should be, auto should be enabled for our tilt. So that's set and active. Our engine fire switches, they're in the in position. So in. Our first officer's radio is set to right. We'll go ahead and get him set. Our transponder TCAS system is in standby, which is where it needs to be currently. So you've got, uh, Floodlights here above the pedestal, we can turn those up, make it a little easier to see. There it goes. OBS audio is set to normal. Finishing up the captain's uh, pre-flight procedure. So from his side of the cockpit, same thing, uh, the auto throttle mode is blank in our FMA, uh, toga toga for roll and pitch. We are, the flight director is currently turned on. Our local altimeter setting is already set to 299 or 2. That is correct for fair weather. Our speed brake lever is in the down position. Uh, no change there. Our thrust reverse and forward are in the set correct position, uh, both off flap lever is currently set. Uh, they're off. Parking brake is set. Uh, flaps over here. Parking brake is set. Our stabilizer cutout switches. The guards are closed. Yes. Fuel control switches are in a cutoff position. That's where they should be right now. Our alternate flaps arm switch and flap selector are off. So over here, the alternate flaps arm off setting is set correctly. 
left radio control is already turned on, so we can hear ATIS, so we're good to go there. And at this point, um, we would do our pre-flight checklist, so we can go back up here to the ECAST page, go ahead and click on checklist, and we have our pre-flight checklist. Oxygen, we've already checked and tested, so we're good to go there. Our flight instruments, we want to just spot check those real quick. Um, I didn't have those. I must have missed those on my checklist here at some point. Um, but we need to set our initial speed to our V2 speed, uh, which go back here to our FMC. Uh, actually, go back to minute reference. So our V2 speed is 143. I want to write these down here real quick. Uh, 137. 143. set this for one point three initial uh, track for our runway is going to be eleven degrees too much eleven degrees we don't have our assigned takeoff altitude yet we'll come back to that here in a moment so flight instruments are set. 10,000 is 10,000 for altitude is probably safe. We'll probably get lower than that. So now that completes our pre-flight checklist. And then we'll have our before start checklist here in a moment. We're going to go back to our engine display. Uh, and here's on my checklist where I go back and I set the indicated airspeed for the V2 setting. Uh, and it's a good thing I'm looking at this because we also want to enable uh, LNAV and VNAV at this point. We've got our initial heading set, initial altitude, we're speculating to be 10,000. And we are awaiting completion of boarding, which is actually already complete. Cargo is loaded, exterior doors are closed, uh, all those doors should be armed. We can just do a quick spot check of our doors from the ECAS page. Everything looks like it's good to go. So we want to remove the jetway now. We'll jump outside real quick. We still have the jetway connected, so using ground services. We're going to get the jetway off the plane, undock it, say goodbye. Now is the time we want to go back to our overhead display and get our hydraulics turned on. With the checklist, apparently we want to start the right electric fuel pump first. So we're going to put it into the auto, pardon me, the auto position. We're going to wait for that fault light to go off. And with that off, we want to get our center one and center two hydraulic pumps turned on. We'll get the rest of these turned on. We're going to get our left electric uh, demand pump turned on as well to auto. We're going to get likewise our air to auto. So that completes uh, this startup. These are the, the engines obviously will remain fault when the engine gets started and this is normal for the uh, C2 to remain fault due to uh, what it calls load shedding before the engines are actually started. We want to go over here to our fuel pumps as well. Um, we need our left and right fuel pumps to be turned on. Now, we would only turn on the center fuel pumps if we had fuel down there in the center tanks. So let me just do a quick spot check here. I'm pretty sure we don't. Fuel. We have no fuel in the center tank, so we have no need to have those pumps on. Back, engine. Back to our overhead here. Now, since we are getting ready to push off and start the engines, perfect time to turn on our beacon light outside. Do a quick spot check of 
ECAS page. We're going to do a cancel recall status here. So what we have is engines are off and TCAS is off, so these are the warnings that we would expect to see at this point. So we don't have any issues there. Spot check our trim real quick. Now that we have hydraulics, we can actually adjust the trim for takeoff. If we look over here at the takeoff page, we can see that for today's flight, we need a trim takeoff of 3.0. Back over to the captain side of the cockpit. Uh, our trim setting is here. Currently, we are, looks like we're at four. And just so we can kind of verify the setting, we're gonna bring up the flight controls. So the flight control display, we can see that the trim stabilizer is set to four. Now we can manually control these buttons here uh, by pushing up on it, dropping it down to three. Or you could use the buttons on your joystick. Oop, come on back. Not too far there. 3.0 and now we see 3.0 also in the flight control page so that's where our trim needs to be aileron trim rudder trim is all set to zero and now we are ready for our before, before start checklist so we'll go back here and grab our checklist button before start flight deck door closed and locked we're good to go we do have uh, our MCP program for takeoff. We do know our takeoff speeds, 137 V1, 137 rotate, and 143 for V2. CDU crew flight is completed. Trim units have been set to 3.0. That basically gets us ready to go for taxi and takeoff, so that is good to go. And we have our before taxi checklist, which we'll come back to here in a moment. Back engines, we we're about set. I've been burning through some fuel. It's time to get this show on the road. What we want to do is file our IFR clearance for our flight today. All right, so we got our departure altitude of 7,000. So we'll go up here to the MCP and change that 10,000 down to 7,000. So now the MCP is ready to go. We also got our squawk identification of 0371. 0371 is currently set. And we'll put this to expander now. Expander. And we are now ready to request ground clearance, so we're going to request our taxi clearance. Ground, Virgin 7258 with Juliet, ready to taxi IFR. Virgin 7258, taxi 2 and hold short of runway 1 right to the taxiway to go Kilo Juliet. Contact tower on 128.425 when ready. Taxi 2 and hold short runway 1 right to the taxiway to go Kilo Juliet. Virgin 7258. Basically, I'm looking at the progressive taxi indications that I just turned on. So we're going to back the plane up. We're going to put the uh, tail to the left, nose to the right. Back out here a little bit just so we can see a little better. So yes, uh, tail to the left, nose to the right. Call for pushback. Tail left, nose right. Ready for 
pushback. Now we've got the wheel chocks and the cones still set up around the plane. Similar to working with Airbus, we've got to remove the wheel chocks before they can start to move, and that's what GSX is warning us about. So we'll go back in here to the captain's side, go down to the CDU, uh, jump back to our FS actions, look at our ground connections and wheel chocks, we want to remove those. Departure check completed. Bypass pin inserted. Release parking brakes. Roger that. Commencing push. All engines clear. Start at will. So all engines clear. So now we can proceed with our engine startup. So overhead console. We're going to start the right engine here first. We're going to put it in the uh, start position. And just so you can see that a little better. So here we'll put it in the start position. And now we need to go down to the uh, pedestal. Start right engine. We'll monitor the startup procedures on our ECAST screen. And at the same time, we want to keep an eye on the taxi. Engine's firing up here. look to be stabilized so we are going to start the left engine Pushback is plenty far enough, far enough for us to do what we need to do. So we're going to tell them to go ahead and stop here. Set parking brakes. like we have parameters stabilized on the left engine start. Everything is green and good to go. Unlocking gear. Uh, with both engines started and stabilized, we can now turn off the tow truck disconnected. Bypass been removed. The APU. We're going to turn the APU to the off position. Left is clear. Right is clear. Get our all clear from the ground crew. Uh, we want to get our flaps set for takeoff, so we're going to uh, flaps 15. We don't 
have any anti-ice requirements. Our APU has been turned off. Uh, we're going to do a quick spot check of our flight controls. So, flight control over here. Oh, I must have clicked it twice. Flight control. Oh, God. Ailerons left and right are good to go. Elevator down, good. Elevator up, good to go. Rudder left. Rudder right. Controls are in good shape. We'll do a quick spot check on our list here. So cancel recall again. Our TCAS is currently off. We're on the ground. We can go ahead and set that for, I think we do that when we get to the runway, but some airports actually support the system being on early. So go ahead and put that to TARA. It'll run in TA mode until we take off. So before taxi checklist, back to the checklist. Anti-ice, no requirement. We did do a check on a recall. Auto brake is already set. Flight controls are checked. Ground equipment is clear. We are good to go. And our before takeoff checklist is already good to go. We'll come back to that here in just a moment. back to our engine display and before we start to move the plane uh, we want to take a quick look and get our overhead taxi lights situated so here's our runway turnoff lights we're going to turn those both on we're going to turn on our taxi light everything else is set and good to go I don't have any other changes I need to make up there to the lights at this point Taxi area is clear. We're ready to turn off the parking brake and start our taxi procedure. So, parking brake off. We're going to start to initially accelerate here a little bit, get the plane rolling, and we're going to do a quick brake check before we get too far. I can see that my accumulator pressure looks good uh, just below the PFD. So, quick brake check. Good to go. Now we'll continue with our taxi. did get uh, signed runway one right. Make sure we slow down to uh, 10 knots ground speed here for our turn. Take this a little wide. speed 16 knots we can get up between 20 and 30 spot check my checklist here Ground speed, ground speed, I should say. 26, speeding up a little bit.
Everybody ready to get out of uh, Washington, D.C.? Uh, this political climate, this is a place that everybody probably wants to leave right now. So, yeah, let's go somewhere fun like uh, Disney World in uh, Orlando. That's what I'm about. It's a beautiful aircraft. And just you wait. I'm flying to 747 too. I'm looking forward to trying that one out. Ooh, that's a little pricey, isn't it? Jeez. All right, remember this is an experiment. Uh, we're only going to be t we're doing a derated takeoff at 75 degrees Celsius derated. That's uh, so it's like 80% power, 83% I believe is what it was. Hopefully we got enough runway to get off the ground. Uh, honestly, I'm a little nervous about it, so uh, this video might be quite short. Approaching zero one right. All right. Uh, let's see here. Cabin crew, prepare for takeoff. We want to get our lights situated. So rather than do it this way, let me just go to the airbrake console, get our takeoff lights turned on, get our strobe turned on. Everything else appears to be good to go. We have our before takeoff checklist. Wrong button. Checklist. No, nope, that's after takeoff. Before takeoff, lap 15, that's all good to go. So we're set there. Go back to our engine display. Our transponder TCAS system is already enabled. We are now ready for takeoff. We want to get clearance. to show on the road. Make sure we can see our PFD here, monitor our speeds. Let's get out on the runway.
On runway, zero, one, right. Okay, we're on the runway. We're gonna just click our clock here real quick and spool our engines up to 50%. Toga. All right, crush fingers. Oh yeah, we're gonna use all the runway. Start to bring our flaps back in. Atomic departure, Virgin 7258 is climbing through 2800 for 7000. Virgin 7258, atomic departure, Roger. Altimeter 2902. I'm going to engage our autopilot. Virgin 7258, turn right heading 040. Proceed on course, climb and maintain 7000. Autopilot, because I need to turn. Everybody, take a chill pill right now. Turn. He said right to four zero. Roger that. Four zero degrees. So watch our climb here. We're climbing up a little fast. our current and so what I did there I know I did I did to execute it. So I signed uh, Rignas as my next waypoint, so now I'm going to execute it. And now the plane is going to start banking right to head towards that particular waypoint. Uh, we got a little bit far, so we're going to kind of double back and zigzag to get back onto our navigation path. And we have some climb guidance, 17,000 feet. See, I told you, I don't have this fully figured out yet, but we're, uh, we're getting close. And we'll start our climb. Let's 
So, yeah, it looks like we're going to get on to our proper flight plan now. So I hadn't quite worked through that. I knew how to change my waypoint, but I, I missed the activation. And I probably could have done that a little bit sooner. taxi lights, and turn off our runway turning lights, we don't need those anymore, at 10,000 feet we'll turn off the landing lights, everything else stays pretty much set to go. Climbing through, oh we are, we're over 10,000. Really, there's not a whole lot left to do at this point. Typical of uh, any flight in flight simulator, kind of monitor systems. I'm not flying with any failures yet. I don't believe I'm ready for that. So, monitor. Ready to cross through 18,000 feet. We'll be able to change our altimeter setting to standard from the barometric pressure of 2992. Uh, climbing actually really fast. Holy cow. Go to standard. Apparently this is a real thing. ATC really make me crazy here. Um, is following the heading of the aircraft. So right now I'm heading uh, 171, but my heading indicator on the MCP is at 11. 
So we want to bring this around to our current heading. 73. And in case we need to engage that, it would suck if it was at 11 degrees and I'm heading 173 as the plane is going to basically do an about turn. to go. Uh, I can go back again to my menu so I can control my ECAS and instead of reaching over to the first officer's uh, display controls and just run the display controls down here. Unfortunately when you do that from any of the CDUs you get the little warning indication up here indicating that the display select panel is I guess disabled uh, or it's just warning you that it's not currently active. And I guess that's helpful if you started clicking on the buttons and nothing was working. Uh, you have to disable it from whatever CDU you take control of it on before these buttons up here will start to work again. Uh, so these buttons are all dead right now since I've taken control of it from the CDU. So I just want to do a quick uh, cancel recall. Our passenger signs are currently set to on. I guess I should turn my seatbelt signs on. So this is already a really long video, and I'm sure that I'm going to be trimming some parts out of it just to try and contain it a little bit. Um, I'm slow at this process. Like I said, I, this is my one of my uh, probably fourth or fifth flight in this plane, uh, trying to learn all the systems and the uh, correct startup procedure for cold and dark and customizing it for my liking and incorporating the GSX and all that fun stuff, uh, which is basically just a long-winded way of saying, liking it. It's a lot of fun and uh, learning these systems is uh, pretty cool. So at this point we are climbing up through, or we're climbing to 37,000 feet, through 30,000 feet right now on our way to Orlando, Florida. And we're going to stop here and advance the video a little closer to our destination. And then we'll pick it up from there with part two, our arrival into Orlando International Airport. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, maybe I taught you a thing or two based off my own experience. I know this plane has been out there forever, but uh, hey, at least you get some new content before the new FSX comes out, which I can't wait to play. See you guys.